Welcome to Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Tonight, would you vote for this man for president? Oh, you dirty boy, you... Oh, oh. And we continue our series, Earth to New York. Tonight, it's Mexico to New York. But first, here's this week's online video review. Our first clip tonight might offend some people because it uses the N-word but it uses it to make the case for not using it. Since New York City Council just passed a symbolic ban on the word aimed mostly at young African Americans, we thought this video from filmmaker Glenn Towery is worth a look. As you'll see, it uses a historical reenactment as a stark contrast with how the word is used today. Y'all see the overseer around here. I ain't seen him, and I'm glad. Shoot, we got to rush some time. This car won't even pay good money for you niggas to be resting. Now get your worth besides back to work. I ain't no nigger. I'm Malagasy. My people are from Madagascar. Where you're wrong, nigger. You're mine, nigger. Now you're gonna be a dead nigger. School that nigger! School that nigger! Yeah! Go back to school, nigger! Oh, no, yeah, nigger. Why are you sitting over here? You tired or something? Nigger, please. I'm a dog down the court for two hours. What up, nigga? You always late. Just chilling. You niggas wanna shoot some hoop? Nigga, please. I'm too tired. Man, you niggas ain't nothing. Respect the sacrifices of your ancestors. Don't use the N-word. Filmmaker Glenn Towery made that posting on YouTube. He calls that, you saw it at the end, don't use the N-word, a public service announcement. And we want your reactions to that video and to this issue. Call us. You should see the number on your screen, 212-251-0801, 212-251-0801. Did City Council do the right thing with its symbolic ban on the N-word, which I as a white person don't feel comfortable saying, but which the people in that video did as actors to make their case not to use the word? Again, call us and react to that video and tell us, in your opinion, did City Council do the right thing with its symbolic ban on the N-word? Call us now, 212-251-0801. 212-251-0801. And while your calls are coming in, let's go to Greenpoint, land of gentrification, and this video, mocking gentrification. Fed up with Manhattan overcrowding? The time to move to Greenpoint, Brooklyn is now. Beautiful luxury apartments are now finishing construction and are in need of beautiful tenants. This means affordable housing can now be yours. Enjoy waterfront views of the city. Take a jog in McCarran Park, where many events take place, including the Billy Berg Film Festival. The Preservation League of New York State put Greenpoint and Williamsburg on the top seven most endangered historic landmarks in the state. Now they've been rezoned so you can own. Take advantage of low introductory pricing. Call 1-80-GENTRIFY today to get the wrecking ball rolling. But where can the artists go now? Not to Park Slope, that's for sure, given the state of gentrification there. But someone in Park Slope with a camera is keeping his eye on construction crews, including one dumping debris at night. This is great. Now they're just taking debris and just throwing it off the back of the house into the backyard. As I said earlier, there's no construction fences. 
up at all whatsoever. So Lord knows where this stuff is falling into the property's backyard, into the neighbor's backyard. I'm waiting for one of these guys to fall off the roof. So that'll be fun. Oh, have they spotted me? I don't know. Well, after that video was posted on YouTube, the construction crew caught on that tape was fined by the city. Now, don't forget, we want your phone calls on the symbolic ban on the N-word by New York City Council. We'll take them in just a minute. 212-251-0801, 212 -251 Call us. And what would you think of that video PSA for not using the word? While your calls are coming in, if you think New York's housing wars are bad, Check out this video from Miami. A few weeks ago, we showed you how police tore down a tent village for homeless people. Here is a video posted in response showing where some of Miami's poorest residents live now. going to provide housing for the people, then the people have the right to take over the land by any means necessary and provide for themselves. And from housing discrimination to employment discrimination, we go north of the border this time, yes, to Canada, where immigration is an issue just like it is here. And given the tensions today between the West and Iran, Iranian immigrants are apparently having trouble finding work. Here is the Toronto area government's video response. So this says you went to Tehran University? Tehran University, yes, I did. Okay, and you graduated with a master degree? Masters in mechanical engineering. Right. And then you were a senior engineer at Barami and Maga? Mokata. Well, this is a great resume. Thank you. So can you work a softy machine? And that's this week's online video review. Now to some of your calls on the City Council's symbolic ban on the N-word and the video that we showed a little earlier. Fred, on the north shore of Staten Island, you're on the air. Hi, Fred. Hi. Uh, hi how are you doing? All right. What do you think? Oh, well, about that word? I think that's a horrible word uh, that demeaned people. Uh, it's inhuman. It's very cruel. And it was a word, I think, that was populated about 25 years ago by Richard Pryor in the sense of a comedian type of joke, but you can never take it serious. In a, I mean, you can't take it in the sense of, 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 of a joke. It's that, that word is, it sends chills to me. When I hear Hispanic kids calling themselves, now I hear some of these young white uh, youth uh, calling that word. That word was to uh, lynch people. It was cruelty. And I, I don't like it. When I and hear and young when you hear, what, what did you think of the way the, the video made the contrast between the, the historical racist use of the word and the casual way that those uh, young black guys on the, on the basketball court were using it? Because they think it means a difference, but it doesn't. You know, you never can glorify that word. And, and, and that is very popular uh, among young blacks to call each other that. And so they're even calling themselves their names. It's just like in Vietnam, they call people gooks. It's a way of dehumanizing yourself. There's a lot of self-hatred is there. Fred, thank you very much for your call. And we go on next to Michael in Chelsea. Hi, Michael. You're on the air. Hi. What do you think? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure whether I consider um, use. I, I can't, like, like you said before, I can't use it myself. I'm, I'm, a, white. I'm a white boy. Um, but I use queer all the time. Uh, and I use fag all the time, and I'm gay. As a way and of I've heard gay used as a pejorative myself. You know, oh, that's so gay, whereas I consider it to be um, a good thing. Um, so I don't, I don't know where the line for pejorative is when, once you've, like, owned the word. Michael, thank you very much. And Saeed in Clinton Hill, you're on the air. Hello. Yes, I would just like to say... Uh, that the younger generation used it to really break the taboo. It was offensive to the older generation. 
uh, Richard Pryor played a major part in desensitizing it, you know, not to be misused, but to desensitize it. Because if if if, if that word was used on a train station or something, a fight can break out. Also, the word nigger originates from the area where a majority of African Americans originated from during the slave trade, which was Niger. Okay, the word Niger, the word Nigeria. You is know, that we, true, or was it just kind of a southern dialect perversion well, yes. of of Negro? Yes. No, you are absolutely correct. If you say Niger with a dialect, a southern dialect, whether it's Irish, God Irish, etc., etc., et you will come up with Niger. You know, not so much. You know, it, it, but the but the part mm -hmm. Niger mm -hmm. itself, that right. whole area was. So when you look at that video, is your reaction that? hey, the way these kids on the basketball court are using it has nothing to do with the way that slave owner is using it, so it's not so toxic? Well, the the uh, the, uh, the uh, film that you, I mean, the, the, uh, the YouTube thing that you just showed was, to me, perfect in the sense that it's to bring the public attention that if a white guy calls somebody, he uses the N-word, yeah. we want to hold him liable. Right. Okay, so it's, and all he has to do is say, well, I thought it was cool. I'm watching TV, you know. So um, uh, you say it at your own risk, so to speak. Yeah. You understand. But I thought it was excellent. Thank you very much for your call. I appreciate it a lot. We'll get one more in here. How about uh, Andrea in Manhattan? Hi, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Oh, uh I, I think people make too much of a big deal out of the word, personally, because, look, Jews call each other kikes, Mexicans call each other wetbacks, Italians call each other guineas. I think the thing about the, the, the service, the public service announcement, I think the thing that should be stressed is the cruelty of the white guy with the whip beating and disrespecting the black people. Whether It doesn't matter what you call them. If you disrespected me and called me bozo, would I care? Thank you very much. I appreciate your call. I appreciate all your calls. And now we continue our series, Earth to New York. This week, it's Mexico to New York. As Google Earth is showing us, it's 2,090 miles from Mexico City to New York, according to the website timeanddate.com. And mapcrow.com tells us it's 1,544 miles from Cancun, the closest point in Mexico to New York. The weather in Mexico City today, partly cloudy and 80. Be patient, New York. We're getting there. I didn't even look up Cancun's weather. I couldn't stand it. But the border between the U.S. and Mexico runs 1,951 miles from San Diego in the west to Brownsville, Texas in the east. President Bush begins a Latin America tour tomorrow. He'll be in Mexico on Monday talking immigration with the Mexican president. And even if you don't know it, New York, this city, far as it is from the border, has become a destination for tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of Mexican immigrants this decade. So let's talk about Mexico and Mexican New York with the Mexican Consul General in New York, Ramon Shilotl, and Baruch College Professor Robert Smith, an expert on Mexicans in New York, author of Mexican New York, Transnational Lives of New Immigrants. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Uh, Professor Smith, if we think of Mexican immigration as a Southwest thing, that's not entirely true anymore, is it? No, it hasn't been true for some time. Um, at least there's been migration of Mexicans to New York at least since the 40s. Um, but, the, but the big migration has come over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and it hasn't only been to New York. There's now sizable Mexican populations in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. You know, we're talking a quarter of a million people. Um, so that it, it's there has been a spread of the there's been a, a, many new destinations that have emerged over the last ten. And years. how large is the Mexican population in New York at this point? Do you think? Well, uh, my estimate is about four hundred and fifty thousand, which is which is in in the city itself. That which starts is, which is to big. rival the Dominican population, which is the largest Latino population, wouldn't it? Dominicans are over 600, mm -hmm. but, but it, it's, it, they're in the ballpark. It's within, by the next census, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, and Mexicans will all be within 100, 150,000 of each other. But yeah. considering that the Mexicans have come mostly 
in the last decade. That's an incredible rate of growth right now. They were about 40,000 in 1980, so it's, it's, it's huge. Yeah, it's a huge increase, yeah. and it's, it will continue. Ambassador, is that uh, about your estimate of the number of Mexicans in New York? Yes, I agree. We are approximately 650,000 Mexicans in New York State and about 450 Mexicans living in the city. You know, I don't have to tell you that many Americans are upset about immigration from Mexico, especially illegal immigration from Mexico. Do you think that the government of Mexico, your government, has a responsibility to do something about the border from your side? Certainly, uh, Mexico thinks that the immigration phenomenon from Mexicans into the United States is a shared responsibility. Certainly, they are Mexicans. We have a responsibility before them. But they are crossing the border because here they obtain jobs. Then it's a shared, a common responsibility. And I think the challenge is how the two countries undertake this situation in a constructive, responsible manner. How, uh, how many of the 450,000 roughly Mexicans in New York do you think are illegal, Professor Smith? Oh, um, an easier question to answer would be of the, of the ones that have come in in the last 10 years, I would say 80, 90 percent probably don't have papers. Wow. So not a, not a, and the, now that 450 number includes you. It's it's Mexican heritage individuals, so it includes U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. um, but of the immigrants that have come in in the last 10 years or so, it's a huge. We've done a number of surveys. Um, it's a huge percentage, and because uh, there's not really very many good options to to legalize. And in one survey we did, that was over 90 percent, and then. People who'd been here more than 10 years was 80-something percent. And you had to be here 15 years or more before you got down into the, into the 70s. So it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a huge problem. You have people now moving through different stages of life as undocumented. People coming here as kids, going through the New York City public schools, graduating, getting married, having kids, becoming parents um, with no chance to legalize their status. This doesn't make any sense to me, right? If this, you get a kid that comes here when he's two years old, right? Now, there's legislation being reintroduced to Congress now called the DREAM Act, which would give these students a chance to legalize their status. I mean, there, there are a variety of different versions of it, but you graduate from a high school, um, you could legalize your status and go on to college. I think something like this is imperative. Um, because it just seems fundamentally unfair for a kid to be playing by the rules, doing the right things all this time, and to be held perpetually um, accountable and to be perpetually excluded. So, Ambassador, you told me off the air that part of your job as Consul General in New York is to interact with the Mexican-American community here, not just government to government. Given that such a large percentage are undocumented, how do you help them either navigate the system or live their lives in New York? What's your role? Well, I am interested in to know how are their main concerns, how are, how are their problems, especially in terms of uh, health services, school services, and certainly to provide documents. Um, a part of the problem is that many of them do not use the bank, banking system, uh, services. They are not familiar with those services, and they prefer to keep their money in cash in the house or in their pockets. Uh, then it's convenient just to educate them how can you say, be beneficial, well, to obtain benefits of being using the banking services. Do you think because so many are undocumented that they're afraid to use the banking system because they think this is contact with the government indirectly? It's part of the, because they do not, they are not familiarized with the banking services. But on the other hand, uh, they have not uh, documents just to open the accounts. And recently, well, in the last years, the banking system has been open to uh, provide services to the Mexican community that it has not documents, only showing the, the passport and some proof of uh, residence or domicile in the So United that's States. all you need? Because I seem to recall recently when I opened a bank account, they did ask for, I think my, well, I guess my driver's license, right, mm -hmm. which is a government document. You can't legally get a driver's license if you're undocumented. 
Yes. So they can use other documents and still legally open a bank account. Yes, that's correct. Congressman, um, uh, the I should say uh, Ambassador, the, the, the Congressman, Brian Bilbray of California, a Republican who's now chairman of the Immigration Reform Caucus, they call it, was on my radio show this morning, and he said Mexico uses illegal immigration to dump poor people on the U.S. Do you think that's true? No, certainly not. I met uh, Brian Bilbrey when I was stationed in San Diego as Consul General. That's his and district, I, the San Diego, And I know yes. his position has always been antagonistic to the immigration uh, situation. But, I mean, Mexico is not resorting to that situation to let our people to immigrate. We respect their desire. Uh, even though in San Diego I heard sometimes that Mexican police or the military should stop the f flow of the Mexican migrants, I think we do not accept that idea. That will put us in a position as a totalitarian state, and we, we want to respect their freedom of movement for the Mexicans. But on the other hand, certainly it's hard to be neighbor of the wealthiest, the richest country in the world. If you compare the wages here in the United States and in Mexico, it's hard to retain our workers. I mean, uh, the last studies show that six of every ten migrants, they had jobs in Mexico. What did they, did they cross the border? What was the reason? Just to obtain better wages then it's not the idea that the Mexican government is promoting the immigration or the private sector doing that. Well, no, well, you talk about the money, and Congressman Bill Bray was also concerned about the amount of money that Mexicans working here send back to their country. He called it one of the biggest sources of income for your country, implying that it's a depletion of wealth that would rightly stay in the United States. Uh, is that a fair concern? No, certainly not. The remittances from Mexico into Mexico represents 2.6% of the GDP of Mexico. It's important, but certainly it's not such as a great concern as comparing with other countries. But on the other hand, we have many uh, American enterprises in Mexico uh, sending back uh, larger amounts of that money. I mean, this is a you mean Global. American businesses uh, under NAFTA? Yes, certainly. It's Robert a Smith. global situation in the world. Yeah, I'd like to weigh in on this because this is a common misconception. You have this, it's a big number, right? Like 20 billion a year that gets remitted by migrants to Mexico. And then you get people saying, look, there, they should be keeping this money in the States. It's money that's earned here. I'd flip the equation around and look at it this way. Um, Mexico raises these workers from age zero to whenever they come here, age 18, right? So, and you know, and, and I've made this point before, children uh, do not produce, right? They consume, they're a net drag on the economy. Then the person becomes working age, the U.S. has invested nothing, the person comes to the U.S., they work for much lower wages, right? They send some of those wages back. Then when the person gets sick or too old to work, they go back to Mexico. So if you look at it in terms of the two systems, the Mexico is subsidizing the U.S. to the tune of billions of dollars a year um, by sending these workers here that the U.S. has paid nothing to raise them and by getting the lower wages. So, it's so to you, that's the larger picture because yeah. your book, which is about transnational life, Mexicans here and Mexicans there, um, includes descriptions of how important for Puebla's economy, uh, the southern Mexican state where the population you studied came from, how important for Puebla's economy are the Mexicans living in New York. For example, their New York Community Association actually funds public works projects back home, you wrote, that the Mexican governments can't or won't. So that's an extraordinarily, whatever it is in dollars, it's an extraordinarily important role that money earned in the United States plays for the maintenance of community services in this Mexican uh, state. Yes, I mean, it, it, it does a lot of things. It, um, it increases the, the level of consumption, right? People can eat better, they can buy medicine. Um, it does a tremendous number of things. 
But it, I think it's, it's wrong to think of it as these are people taking money out of the United States. You, what you have here is a binational system of reproduction, right? You have people who very often have their families back in Mexico, right? The place of production where people work is the U.S., but the place where people very often have their families is back in Mexico. So, and, and it, people would like to have their families here, but very often they, they can't. So I think it's, it's too narrow of a view to think of just the money going back and that's it. Let's take a look at a little video that we found on YouTube. We know the biggest private employer in the United States is Walmart. Well, guess who's the biggest private employer in Mexico? Here's a little video of the beginning of one of their famous open of shift chants. complete with subtitles and a correction that didn't come off of YouTube. That actually came from the Wall Street Journal's website. Ambassador, look familiar? Yes, it's familiar. <laughs> yes, it is. How big an employer is Walmart in Mexico? It's an important employer, but I'd like to bring the attention that, the, unfortunately, Walmart has been purchasing Mexican businesses, the chain of supermarkets that already existed in Mexico. Uh, we expected better investment and new ones instead of buying the present ones. Aha, uh -huh. so you have an issue with Walmart. Can your government regulate that in some way? No, it's free for the American businessmen just to invest in the way they want. But uh, on the other hand, we'll be more fortunate if Walmart uh, had invested in new jobs and new businesses. Why is it so hard? for Mexico to have more prosperity. It's an old country, it's a proud country, it's right next to the United States with all our wealth here. Why do we constantly hear, generation after generation, of Mexico's small middle class, relatively, and large poor population? Well, it's a very complex uh, answer, but I could uh, say that we had a um, problems in, uh, in our microeconomics since the 70s. And just to correct them, it took 30 years. Now the economy is strong, the fundamentals are strong. We are in the position to generate growth. But if we remind the 80s and 90s, uh, they were uh, called the decades for Latin America as the lost decades. There were no growth in the Latin American countries then we suffer the, those consequences. But certainly we are in the best position just to create jobs. In order to retain our workers and to stop the migration uh, continuing to the United States, we need f at least 25 years of sustained growth, I mean at 6% per year, and that will give us the enough room just to retain our workers. And it is the the sire of the Mexicans. How much growth per year do you have in the last, say, 12 years or so since NAFTA went into effect? It has been about, the average is 2, 3 percent. Not good. N not good. It's good, but not enough but about what we really want. How are you going to get to six? Well, we are working in that direction. Let us say uh, to talk the Minister of Treasury and uh, Finance in Mexico. Robert Smith, you're not an economist. You're studying the Mexican immigrant population mm -hmm. here in New York. Do you have any thoughts about this, though? I mean, I think one of the, one of the keys here would be a more European Union-style integration. Um, I mean, NAFTA was a free trade integration with, with limits. It favored capital movement, certain kinds of investment. Um, but you think about Italy, for example, right? For years, no one wanted Italy to join the European Union because they were afraid they'd be swamped by Italian workers. Now Italy is a country of immigration, right? It, it's a, it's trying, it has its own problem of people coming into the country. 
one of the reasons that Italy and Ireland, for example, um, have become countries of immigration is because when they joined the European Union, it was preceded by billions of dollars of investment, right? And so, and not, you know, not loans, not a debt crisis, but, um, but, but a, a systematic plan of investment. The U.S. Um, and Canada and Mexico should embark on a plan like that. It's quite feasible that within 20 years you could have no migration problem from Mexico. Um, it's quite feasible with, with a systematic plan. The way population growth has been taken uh, has, has fallen so dramatically in Mexico over the last 15 to 20 years. It's a, it, it's a manageable problem within the next 20 to 25 years. You like that idea? Yes, I completely agree. I like the, the idea. Certainly, when we look at Spain or Portugal, when they joined the European community, immediately the prosperity came. And I think the idea is feasible, as Robert said. Would that mean open borders like they have in the EU? Why not? Uh, I mean, uh, I remember in the 80s, one American diplomat said or proposed or suggested the idea that if the United States gives a visa for a foreigner, that visa allows him or her just to cross the border without second inspection. In, I mean, going to Canada or to Mexico. I mean, it's exactly like the European Union. You is know doing. how threatening many Americans would find the idea of open borders between here and Mexico. They would say it's easy to get in to the other countries in Latin America easier than it is to the U.S. for a terrorist, and then they could come across the border. They would also say that more, because of the economic disparity still, mm -hmm. places like San Diego and maybe even New York would be swamped by Mexicans wanting to move here for the immediate short-term gain. Well, probably it's a um, very disputable idea, but I think that represents a trend, a future position. If now a days is not the time, probably 20 or 30 years mm. from now, that will be feasible, completely feasible. So when President Bush visits your president, President Calderon, in Mexico on Monday, is this the kind of thing that President Calderon might bring up with him, an EU-style integration? Well, it's possible, but what President Calderon has said is that he prefers an investment of uh, one kilometer of road or highway in Mexico instead of building a wall in our common border, that it is more practical and makes more sense in economic terms. But on the other hand, what we want is to present to the Americans the secure or safe country just for investment. We want to keep or retain our workers there, if they are, and the American investment is welcome. President Bush is making this Latin America tour in part to counter the challenge of leadership in the hemisphere posed by Venezuela's president, Hugo Chavez, who has a leftist economic agenda and who's becoming more and more popular in the region. Mexico itself almost elected uh, Obrador as president, which would have taken Mexico in a more leftist direction. Do you think that this competition between Bush and Chavez gives your government an opening to ask for something new from the United States? Well, for Mexico, it's important just to keep a, a, an open dialogue with the President of the United States, always, now and in the future. And if that, in that regard, we'd also want to have a good relationship, a good bonds with the rest of countries in Latin America. I mean, this concern belongs to United States and President Chavez of Venezuela. They have the appropriate answer. For Mexicans, the President of the United States is always welcome. What do you think of President Chavez? What does your government think of him? Some good, some bad? Well, the President, president Chavez is the President of the Venezuelans. They elected him, and we respect the will of the population, and we want to have a and keep a good relationship with the, him and with his government. One other thing. President Bush will apparently be offering new labor standard protections in trade agreements. This is something he's been reluctant to offer before. And again, this is seen as a response to Chavez. Um, would you like to see NAFTA upgraded to include more explicit labor protections? Oh, yes, sure. 
that's the desire of many sectors in Mexico, that NAFTA, it was a good deal uh, with the three countries, but certainly it was short because it did not uh, include the concerns about uh, Mexican workers and also American workers in the area. But that's a, for th those certain these sectors, this is a pending matter. And if the NAFTA extends with that regard, I mean, it, it, it will not be bad to the contrary. So what, for example, give me one example of a protection that could be included in NAFTA to make it better for the workers. I mean, we have to provide the channels to for a exchange of workers to facilitate the admission of the, of them and certainly to be sure that the working conditions are um, respected accordingly mm -hmm. with our respective laws. Before you go, Robert Smith, what's your next project? How are you going to continue studying the Mexican community in New York? I have been, um, I've been doing uh, work on the second generation, the children of, of immigrants, um, and I've been working quite closely with, um, on a project called the Mexican Initiative at CUNY, which is outreach to the Mexican community to try to get more Mexicans to apply to college. The consulate's been collaborating with Baruch and with the CUNY Central Administration. Um, it's, uh, it, and Jay Hershenson, David Birdsell, and others have been very supportive of From this. From the CUNY administration. Yeah. All right, quick. Ambassador, you've been here eight months now in New York. What's your favorite Mexican restaurant? Well, uh, there are many Mexican restaurants in the area. You can't say a favorite. I, it's hard for me to <laughs> say, but believe me, they are genuinely, genuinely Mexican taste. Tastes. Robert Smith, maybe you don't have to be such a diplomat. Um, just walk down Fifth Avenue in, um, in Sunset Park and go into any place that, that's got a flag on the front and you'll be happy. Fifth Avenue in Sunset Park. I'm there. <laughs> Thank you both very, very much. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Coming up in a minute, we begin our coverage of the Giuliani for President campaign. No one knows Rudy like New Yorkers know Rudy, so let's get real. After this break, this is Brian Lehrer Live. This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. We're at the hospital. We're going to take you as the ambulance. I had a heart attack when I was 48. We're going to be okay. I survived, but I'll always be at risk for another. What do you got? I think she's having a heart attack. Let's get and my heart may never be the same. Two, three. Heart disease is the number one killer of women. Now I'm taking steps to lower my risk. But I wish I'd done it earlier, for myself and for my family. The heart truth starts with you. Find out your risk and take action to lower it. This is Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. And you can sign up for the podcast of this program now. Go to cuny.tv. Now we begin our coverage of the Giuliani for President campaign. No one knows Rudy, like New Yorkers know Rudy, so let's get real. What do his eight years as mayor tell us about what kind of a president he would make? Well, for one thing, New Yorkers may have been less surprised than other Americans to learn about his children's estrangement from him after his divorce from Donna Hanover. That just broke over the weekend. Here's how the former mayor commented publicly about it for the first time in California on Monday. 
And I believe the responsibility is mine. And I think that these problems with blended families are, um, are difficult sometimes. They're not always, but sometimes they are. And I think you get these things resolved. And I, I, look, I know it's a presidential campaign and everything else. If you guys give us the maximum degree of privacy. The responsibility of mine is mine, a different line than he was using in the midst of the breakup with Donna Hanover. But will Judy Nathan exit for a fourth wife in the White House? Who knows? But if Giuliani's a good president, who cares? We will hear from Rudy's supporters in the future. But tonight, a major press critic of Giuliani, Village Voice columnist Wayne Barrett, author of two Giuliani books, Grand Illusion, The Untold Story of Rudy Giuliani and 9-11, and Rudy, an investigative biography of Rudy Giuliani. Wayne, welcome to the program. Hi there. Glad to be here, Brian. Uh, Rudy Giuliani is leading nationwide in the polls by a large margin for the Republican presidential nomination, at least as of now. Do you see his Giuliani image around the country as a grand illusion? I do. You know, I really do. I, uh, this is the first guy to run for president on the strength of a perceived performance on a single day. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me at all that the performance is so striking. Every American knows where they were that day. Everybody thinks they know what Rudy did that day. So it's such an important day. We see him as the guy who stood up the day we were attacked. There's so many other questions, fundamental questions, raised and dealt with in our book about his performance in the lead up to 9-11, even about critical mistakes that he made that day. And we all know the many mistakes that occurred afterwards in the aftermath of 9-11 with all the toxins at Ground Zero and the way in which people are still suffering with the consequences of that. So it's, it's somewhat of a mystery why it's become unpatriotic to question Rudy Giuliani's performance on 9-11, but it seems to have become that. But people have this image of a mayor who, at least on, this, on that day, and we're going to go way beyond that day in this discussion, at least on that day, appeared strong and compassionate in a way that gave a lot of comfort to people who were really in a state of shock, both here in the city and nationwide. You give him that, don't you? He said all the right things that day and for many days after that until he decided within two weeks of 9-11, I remind you, to try to abolish the term limits law that he himself had supported and get a a third term out of his performance said, on 9 such an emergency yeah. right now that I have to stay in right, as right. mayor. Right, and I, you know, but there's no question I wrote the most favorable copy about Rudy that I've written in years the week after 9-11, and, and it was hard not to be impressed about the way he handled himself. I'm still impressed about the way he handled himself that day, but I remind you, Brian, he was heading not to the scene of the crime. I mean, that's what so many people think, well, geez, he was there. But he what if if he had put the command center where his own top emergency management people told him to put it, which was in Brooklyn, which is where Ray Kelly and Mike Bloomberg had put it, he wouldn't have been there. The emergency command center for the city of New York was in the World Trade Center, right. placed there after the 1993 attack. Right. So some people, you certainly could argue that that wasn't smart, putting it right where you think the target might be. Well, not only did some people think it was dumb, his own... His own police commissioner, we reveal in the book, Howard Safer, called it Ground Zero in 1997 because of the attack there in 1993. He thought it was crazy to put it you, you, there. You said he made some mistakes on 9-11 itself? Like yes. what? Well, I mean, the critical mistake that he makes is he's going to the command center. He gets to the command center. Bernie Carrick is standing out in front of it and says, we can't go in. We're vacating the building. Then he says, well, let me go to the command post. Now, there's a, quite a difference between a command center, which is a standing operating facility with all kinds of technological uh, abilities, and a command post, which is basically a bunch of card tables that any fire, you know, the fire chief set, out, set up outside any fire. He said, I want to go over to West Street, which is where the fire chiefs had the command post. So he brings all the top police brass with him to the command post on West Street, where all the top fire chiefs are. Now, his own unified command protocols, as well as the unified command protocols everywhere in America, says you've got to have a unified command post in an, an emergency like this. Instead, he leaves with all the top co police commands and goes to this building on Barclay Street and brings all the top police brass with him, effectively splitting the command operation of that day so that when the police radios say, because the helicopter pilots were saying 
the buildings are going to partially collapse, and they predicted the partial collapse of both of the buildings. The only people who hear that are the people on the police radios, whereas if he had left just one of the top police brass at the fire chief command post and established a unified command post, we wouldn't have had the communication breakdown we had. But don't you have to give them a little bit of slack for making tough calls in the, in the middle of an entirely unprecedented situation. There was I'd no him, single right thing I'd to do. I'd give him a lot of slack, okay? I'd say, look, it was a chaotic moment, so he violated his own protocols. Except he himself has said, as well as all of the media supporters of him have said, how coolly he conducted himself. He's the greatest crisis manager that ever existed. And it's not just his media supporters who said that. He himself has said, my father taught me how to handle a crisis like that. I just rose to the occasion. So look, if you were, if you were a guy saying, look, I was as lost as anybody else was that day then this would be an unfair critique. But when you stack it up against the way he describes himself, I think it's fair game. Viewers, we are opening up the phones for the next few minutes. Here's the question. What does Rudy Giuliani's legacy as mayor say about what kind of president he would be? You're New Yorkers. Many of you are here at the time that he was mayor. What does Rudy Giuliani's legacy or record as mayor say about what kind of president he would be, good, bad, or, or otherwise. 212-251-0801. Give us a call, 212-251-0801. The number is on your screen. For Wayne Barrett, Village Voice columnist and author of two critical biographies of Rudy Giuliani, we will have a more supportive guest in subsequent weeks to answer the same question about how Rudy's mayoralty predicts what kind of president he would make. And, and Wayne, off of 9-11, um, when I think about Rudy Giuliani's legacy and how it might predict what kind of president he would be, the first thing that comes to mind is he came in with almost a single-minded agenda to clean up the streets. And in many respects, he succeeded. He polarized the city in many ways in doing so, but he succeeded in what he set out to do in that respect. Do you agree? You don't mean with a broom. You're talking about street crime. We're talking about street crime and the quality of life crimes that the broken windows well, Brian, theory says uh, leads know. into street crimes, panhandling, turnstile jumping, whatever it is. New York is seen now as a much more orderly place than it was at that time, which many people argue has fueled the growth of property values, of the resurgence of New York as being as desirable a place as it is today. The seven FBI crimes that are reported annually to the FBI by every police department in the city. How many months had they declined, Brian, before Rudy Giuliani became mayor? You tell me. 36 consecutive months, every single one of the seven crimes reported to the FBI by the NYPD had declined for 36 consecutive months, many of them by very large numbers. How long have they declined since he left office? You tell me. Now, for five years, we have seen a decline since he left office. In every single one of the FBI, with the exception of rape, every single one of the FBI crime statistics is down since he left office. How much credit do we give Rudy Giuliani but don't for that? But don't the statistics also show that the drop in crime under Giuliani and Bratton, I guess together they came up with this uh, ComStat system. I don't think they did it together at all. You know, I reported in that book, that, and I got it straight from Bill Bratton. Bratton that, did it. That, the yeah, police Bratton didn't have any idea, time. which uh, Giuliani deserves all the credit in the world for hiring Bill Bratton. He's one of the great police minds of our time. There's no question that Bill Bratton instituted police strategies that aided the reduction of crime. Giuliani deserves credit for that. And I'm not crime saying went it didn't, down but I think it's more precipitously in New York than it did in other places as crime was going down nationally and has continued to go down in New York in most of those categories, as you say, as it has started to come back in many other places in the country? Well, I would say this, Brian. Rudy Giuliani hired Bill Bratton. It was a fine decision. He fired him because he was getting too much credit for the decline in crime. He deserves to be condemned for firing the best police commissioner that the city had because he was getting credit disproportionate to what Rudy expected. And it was interesting get. to see, actually, in that clip that we played, which was Rudy Giuliani uh, in California, in LA, in fact, I think, uh, with Governor Schwarzenegger, Bill Bratton 
did not make an appearance in support of his old boss's campaign. So for whatever reason, that falling and, out and persists Bill to this day. And Bill is continuing the decline, the rapid decline of crime in Los Angeles. He's a great police mind. Now, I am not saying that Rudy Giuliani deserves no credit whatsoever. I think he deserves some credit whatsoever. Ray Kelly and Lee Jones were the police commissioners for the 36 months that crime went down under the Dinkins administration. I think they deserve some credit. The mythology says he got rid of the squeegees, and yet Bill Bratton himself in his own book said there wasn't a squeegee on the street when I took office. Ray Kelly got rid of them all. So part of this is mythology. Can an Italian kid from Brooklyn and Long Island win over Southern evangelicals in Republican primaries? Here is Rudy Giuliani speaking at the National Conservative Political Conference last week. We, we don't all see eye to eye on everything. Uh, you and I have a lot of common beliefs that are the same, and we have some that are different. I don't agree with myself on everything. Um, some of his other top priorities as mayor Reducing welfare rolls. Brian, that was not a funny line when you said I don't agree with myself some of the time. Why? Because he's already changing his position on abortion. He's already changing his position on gun control. These issues that have meant so much to him in his life. How is he changing his position on abortion? Well, he's now saying he would elect strict constructionist judges, and he's sending the clear signal that they will overturn Roe v. Wade and that he has no problem with that. Strict constructionist judges is code for overturning Roe v. Wade. I think that's the way everybody's reading it, and I think that's the way we're intended to read it. The man has actually said, I was only in favor of gun control because I was the mayor of New York, and so I was concerned about guns then. When he was the second highest ranking person in the Justice Department in the Reagan administration, he testified in Congress against his own administration on gun control. That's when he was a man of principle. When uh, conservatives talk about Rudy Giuliani and judges, they're sometimes concerned with too many what they see as left-leaning judges that he appointed as mayor. Well. You know, he was a progressive mayor in some respects. He certainly was a progressive mayor on domestic partnerships. He was a progressive mayor on abortion questions. He's abandoning all that. He's trying to turn that around, and he's reshaping himself. So, yes, he doesn't agree with himself all the time. Some of his other top priorities uh, as mayor, reducing the welfare rolls, he did that, getting what he saw as extreme multiculturalism out of the public schools. He fired the chancellor at the time or had him fired. Um, to, uh, you could argue he did that. Uh, he reduced remedial education at CUNY. That was one of his goals, and he got that done. Can you say that he accomplished a lot of these goals, that he was effective as mayor, well, even as he alienated a lot of people in ramming through the things that he thought were important? Well, we've, we've never had any indication. Giuliani never supplied any evidence whatsoever that the people who were forced off the welfare rolls wound up with jobs. There was no serious job program. It was just get find out a way to cut them off the rolls in the most unfair way you could conceive of most of the time. So yeah, he managed to reduce the rolls, but not in any sort of a way that gave those people any sort of a better life. Temporarily, some of them wound up on workfare, which was a program that the federal courts have assailed Giuliani about how it was run, the workfare program. So yes, he's had some he had some success in reducing the welfare rolls. Unemployment no isn't any higher today. In fact I think it's lower. They have to be seeking than at a the job. Peak of they have to be seeking a job. To count on the unemployment. So people rolls. aren't even counted. Well yeah, so they're not even being counted. We're not talking about people with skills who can go out and get a job. Right? We're talking about people who needed training. If you were gonna have if you were going to knock them off the welfare rolls and improve their lives, then you had to have a training component. He refused to hear the word training. Let's take a phone call. Jim and Bensonhurst. Hi, Jim. You're on the air. Hey, how are you? How, how are you doing? Um, I, I think with Giuliani, I, I think he's a great leader. I, I don't know if I'd want him as my father or the CEO of my company, and because I think he could, he could, I think he could make a decision very easily to to close a plant, but. I think the guy can make a decision. I, I really think that, you know, he sees what the problem is and he really addresses it. So would you want him as your president, if not your CEO or your father? Um, I'd like him as my president. I, I, I really do. I think he'd do a fine job. You know, I don't think he's warm and fuzzy. There's nothing about him, but the guy's definitely a leader. Jim, thank you very much. And uh, Patrick in Manhattan, you're on the air. Hi, Patrick. Hi. Sometimes I think people forget to observe the role that demographic change had in reducing crime. But I do know that if 
Giuliani became president, there would be no more ferrets in the United States. Because remember, he, he had, for some reason, he had this thing about ferrets where he would rail against them on his radio show. And What was the thing with ferrets? Was that oh, a ferret it was an enemy a day. I mean, you know, he had a thing about street merchants. He had a thing about uh, cab drivers. You know, he went from thing to thing, especially in the second term. The first term, he was a little more right. focused on solving real problems. But the second term, he, you know, he was just kind of making up a new problem a day. We're gonna ferrets were one of them, and we're gonna, I can't remember what it was about. We're going to run out of time soon. But he also had a foreign policy of sorts as mayor. He kicked Yasser Arafat out of some event in Lincoln Center that Arafat had crashed. There was some incident with, with Castro also, was there? Yeah. Well, you know, we deal with the Arafat incident in the second book, Grand Illusion, because he contended at the time that the reason why he kicked Arafat out was because when he was United States attorney, he had investigated Arafat for the murder of Leon Klinghoffer, the famous case, and for other murders. Well, it turns out He'd never investigated Leon Klinghoffer. He'd never done anything. And we established that from the very federal prosecutors who did investigate the murder of Leon Kling Klinghoffer and who made cases based on it. Rudy had absolutely nothing to do with it. There's one other thing that may come back to haunt Rudy Giuliani. When he was mayor of New York, he appeared in drag several times in comedy sketches, like on Saturday Night Live. Now, we know it was comedy. But when you search Rudy Giuliani on YouTube, here is the first thing that comes up for all of the rest of America to see. You know, you're really beautiful. And a woman that looks like that has to have her own special scent. Oh, thank you. Maybe, maybe you could tell me what you think of this scent. Hmm, I like that. This, this may be the best of all. Oh, you dirty boy, you! Oh, oh! Donald, I thought you were a gentleman. Hmm. You can't say I didn't try. That's going to be a lot of Americans' first impression of Rudy Giuliani other than 9-11. Wayne Barrett, who also once wrote a book about Donald Trump, didn't you? I did indeed, yeah. Thanks a lot for joining us. We'll get a more positive view of Rudy Giuliani from another guest in a few weeks as we cover that campaign as only New Yorkers can. And that's it for tonight's show. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30, and you can sign up for the free podcast of this program at CUNY.TV. And don't forget my daily radio show on WNYC, New York Public Radio, weekday mornings at 10. Tomorrow morning, the president of Columbia University, Lee Bollinger. That's at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning on WNYC, 93.9 FM and 820 AM. Have a great night.